Jay. Jay Shear. Jay Shear. Jay Shear. Jay Shear. Business Consultant. Jay Shear. Jay Shear Business Consulting. Welcome. I'm Jay Shear with Jay Shear Business Consulting. We build solid foundations for service based businesses to grow and scale and achieve the results and success they deserve. And you've joined Business Minds Coffee Chat. Albert Einstein said, adversity introduces a man to himself. Our guest has faced his share of adversity to become a force of nature who turns challenging situations into gold. He's a husband and father, a speaker, an executive coach, author, and podcast host. Prior to starting his coaching business, he had a successful sales career in the tech startup world where he generated over $90 million in sales and received numerous awards. Please welcome the man who is mastering midlife, Mark J. Silverman. Mark, thank you so much for being here. It's great to see you. Hi, Jay. Thanks for, thanks for having me on the show. I was thinking, Neil, instead of water, I should have coffee to make this really authentic. That's okay. Um, I've got my water next to me as well, but I was drinking my coffee earlier. Well, let's dig right in. You and I, in full transparency, you and I are in a mastermind group together. That's how we first met. And it has been a remarkable journey to this point, to say the least. And the best part about this entire mastermind experience has been meeting remarkable people like you and that's learning always, that's from always, that's always the best part of the of a mastermind is meeting meeting the cool people that that uh, are like-minded and, and heading for similar goals yeah, that that's exactly right and even though we have fantastic guests on which which i also see tremendous benefit from the people that we spend the most time with learning from their stories learning about their their ups and downs the challenges how they faced adversity head on how they continue to push through and just getting connected right learning from one another and your story and i only know pieces and parts of it but your story is one that is truly inspiring to me on multiple levels. So where I thought a good starting point would be, would be for you to share a thumbnail sketch of your journey and how you landed where you are today. That, that's a, that, that's a tough one. Would you know, do we, do you have three hours for this, for this, uh, I'm, uh, we, we talked about this actually last night that I'm always afraid that me telling my story is going to turn into shtick. Uh, you know, we all, we all go through stuff and I went through quite a bit of stuff. And when I tell my story, it's really, really dramatic. Uh, and when I tell it, I want to make sure that people understand that, that uh, it was real life experiences that happened, that happened to me, that I actually take responsibility for creating in my life. Uh, but going through them and being being uh, full of grace, having survived them, uh, makes all the difference in the world to be able to tell the story. So the way I, the way I told the story to a CEO once who was hiring me to coach two of his vice presidents, he walks in, he sweeps into the office, you know, just all uh, you know confidence and everything. He says, "Silverman," he says, "What's your story?" And I don't even know where this came from. I said, well, uh, 19, in 1987, I came to Washington, D.C., homeless and 135 pounds living in my truck. Six years later, uh, I was married with kids and a millionaire. I'm basically a short Jewish Tony Robbins. <laughs> so I, I, I had to turn it into shtick. I don't even know where. He goes, I like you. <laughs> and, uh, You're hired. <laughs> okay, 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 cool. Because you know, I was on the 19th floor of this skyscraper in this you know, private equity firm and you know just reeks of money and all that and i've figured i might as well get all of it out in one one fell swoop but the truth is uh up until i was 27 i was not a going human concern uh you know drugs alcohol sex addiction just just um everything that will destroy a person from the inside out i was basically you know a, a rock and roller without any music <laughs> mm. uh, and i landed i landed here in washington dc and my brother 
you know, helped me get sober, wound up going to college uh, and getting married, having kids. Uh, and, and somehow I talked my way into a sales position. I was very, very introverted and I, I didn't like to bother people. So I don't know how I made it as a sales guy, but I wound up doubling my income every year uh, for several years until I was now affluent and living in a really affluent neighborhood, driving a Lexus convertible, that kind of thing. So that, that uh, really whiplash worthy change in my lifestyle helped me see success and see what I see what I do in life from a different lens. I never felt like I belonged anywhere, uh, especially in, in the affluent circles that I that I ran in. So I think that gave me a unique opportunity to look at things a little bit differently. Now, fast forward, you know, a few years later, when my kids are, you know, young teenagers, uh, my wife and I divorce, and I hit rock bottom, stone cold sober. You know, so, so here we go with the you know, more dr drama, but I got really, really sick. I was having panic attacks. We had separated. I couldn't sell anything. And my badge of honor now, you know, because I was poor and homeless, my badge of honor was how much money I made. Uh, my self-esteem went in the toilet and I was suicidal and depressed, stone cold sober, because there were still things that weren't dealt with for the reasons that I drank in the first place. So dealing with all those things and coming back out of that a second time, uh, I think is, is, again, where the grace comes in. Uh, I feel, you know, everything I do today is gravy. Well, so I, I, I want to go back a bit because you, you've given a great thumbnail sketch, which is exactly what I asked for. And I appreciate that. I think what's important is not where we've come from, but the person that we're becoming. And in order to overcome the challenges that you faced and the adversities that you went through, we never do that alone. You mentioned as an example, your, your brother who, who helped you with um, getting sober. As you, as you look back, can you speak to other individuals or methods of being able to overcome adversity, who provided a guiding hand and what was that experience like? There's basically an army of people who helped put me back together. Uh, you know, it even started with, uh, I got, I was, I was part of EST and the, uh, and that, that self-help movement way back when. Uh, and as culty and as, as kind of weird as the, the part that, you know, and I'm not putting down S, the part that I was involved in was it saved my life. Like it took me off the streets and got me to start, you know, at least start on the journey of becoming a whole human being. Uh, but then when I got sober, my brother threw me into Narcotics Anonymous and Alcoholics Anonymous. And that's where I learned to make friends uh, and, and have a posse of people that I, that I, uh, depended on. We had dinner every Thursday night before we went to the men's AA meeting. We, you know, we, we, we had these things because we we're all desperately clinging to some semblance of sobriety. So I learned how to build a posse of people through 12 step programs that, you know, fast forward that later, I did something called the mankind project, uh, uh, MKP for short mkp.org, where I went through experiential weekends, where I confronted a whole bunch of stuff from childhood and learned to be a better man, better father, better husband, all that stuff. So I think through my whole entire career, through my whole life, uh, it's been people uh, helping me along. And I, I, I'm so grateful for that because I know a lot of people don't create that in their lives. Well, and, and that's a point that I appreciate you hitting on because that's an important one that I wanted to make sure that our listeners and viewers are hearing that we don't have to go through these situations alone. We don't have to go through the life challenges that we all face alone. There are plenty of options for help. And the key is to meet someone where they are and to be in a position where you can ask for help. So thank you, Mark, for sharing that. I appreciate it because I, I do think it helps give us a bit of context around not only your, your story, but also the fact that you have come through some very difficult and challenging times. You asked for help. Help was provided in a multitude of different ways. And you are a shining example of possibilities 
that are endless and you continue to shine bright each and every day and inspire others, which you're certainly inspiring me, not only through your story, but most importantly, through your actions in what you're doing today. So, so thank you. No, thank you. Uh, can I, just, I just want to say uh, uh, something that you just said uh, made me think, you know, I talk to a lot of people for some reason, I'm a, I'm a crisis attract. Like I, I attract people who are in crisis uh, uh, and Often I will meet people and they'll say, there's no help. Nobody will help me. There's nobody there for me. I am all alone in this. And that is a very real experience for people that they don't have the help, that they don't have the resources. And if they ask, nobody would help. Sometimes, you know, when you, when you crash and burn, you've created it that way. You've just burned so many bridges that there's nobody there for you, or it seems that way. But it's just not the case. You got to open your mind. Sometimes the help doesn't look like what you think it's going to look like. The, the, you know, the merry band of misfits that helped me get sober didn't look like guardian angels, you know, like, so, so really being open to take the help wherever it can get and then help yourself where you can. As soon as somebody gives you an inch, you go find an inch for yourself, right? So if someone gives you a couple bucks for a meal, right now, what are you going to do with that full belly? What do you, you know, so, so it's, a, it goes hand in hand, uh, but really open up your mind that the world isn't as bleak as it looks. It's just what you've created in your mind. There is help. Powerful point and definitely speaking the truth there. And you also made a comment that you tend to attract a certain type of individual. And you, know, you and I have talked about this in the past that we attract who we are and we attract what we put out. And you know, that's, a, that's an energy that, that is, is very apparent. And so I, I completely get where you're coming from on that, because I look around at the types of clients that I work with. And when I'm working with a particular client, when they look at their customer base and they take a look at the types of customers that they are doing business with, it all has to do with what we put out and how we structure our ourselves and it's really interesting when we do start to look at the people that we surround ourselves with, why that happens and what that tells us about ourselves. True. And so, I'll, yeah. I'll tell you, I don't, I don't surround myself with people who are crashing and burning. I surround myself with people who are ahead of the curve and where I want to be. I'm, I'm in awe of anybody who's in my life. But I will, I, my, my heart opens to anybody who's hit a wall because I've hit so many walls that I want to, you know, I want to give a helping hand. Uh, and what I, one of the things I've learned is if I give a helping hand over and over and it's not being uh, taken advantage of by the, by the person who's helping, I can't go drown with someone else. I, you know, I learned that from helping other alcoholics uh, and, 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 you know, just, there's too many, too many people will be perfectly happy to drain the life out of you. So that discernment mm -hmm. of the people pleasing and the codependency to actually helping someone get up a rung on the ladder is a, uh, is a really important skill, especially when you're in that helping field, like you and I are. Absolutely. Well, so let's, let's talk about a mastermind experience for a moment, since that's where we met and you talk about surrounding yourself with people who not only challenge you, but people that you look up to, people you want to learn from, people who are further down the road than where you are right now. What, what is the importance of being involved in a mastermind group to you? And this is not the only mastermind that you've been involved in before. No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm almost always in a mastermind. In fact, I have one, uh, part of a mastermind I was in years ago a few of us actually started having a call on Friday afternoons at two o'clock. Uh, and uh, it's been five, over five years. And we still meet at two o'clock on Friday every week. And we're all really busy, super busy people. But we were just noticing that it doesn't take an effort. We block that time out on our calendars. And no matter where we are in the world, unless we're at a customer site or we're on a specific vacation and really need to give that time to our families, we show up on that call for each other for over five years. So I always have that going on, but then I join masterminds for specific reasons, uh, something I wanna learn, the one we're in now, you know, I came to learn how to be better on video to get my message across to tell my stories better. And then of course, whatever always happens is 
what you come for isn't what you usually get for from the mastermind. It's usually the people. It's usually it's usually something very different, which is in this case. But the, you know, in Think and Grow Rich, they talk about the power of the mastermind, and I I, I think it can't be expressed enough. I'm starting a mastermind uh, next week uh, for a bunch of people that I coach, and you know, because I know a lot of really successful men. All of my clients are ridiculously successful, are ridiculously competent. Uh, uh, smart people, but most men don't have friends. They don't have people they can trust. They don't have that personal board of directors that you need in order to, to function in life. They go it alone or they have their sister or they have this person they play golf with, but that's it. So masterminds really help, I think, especially men uh, foster deeper relationships. Yeah, that's, uh, it's an interesting point. And in this particular one that we're involved in, it has been pushing us and challenging us to go beyond our comfort zones when it comes to video. And, you know, I've looked at the transformation that you've made and your video content and the way that you come across in front of the camera and the messaging uh, that you're able to put out into the world. And it, it really is inspiring to see that transformation take place when I kind of wind the camera back to when we first started those first videos that that I put out that you put out and the others that are in the mastermind group to where they are today you you can see a a marked change in ability comfort level and just the ability to articulate the message itself and have that connect with people everything's a skill like everything is a skill that you need to practice and learn. Like even, even showing up alive on video is a practice skill. I, I remember you know, always thinking, why can't, I sh why can't I show up in, in groups of people the way I show up with my sons? There's something really fun about me and really strong and powerful when I'm in dad mode. And then I go into a business meeting and all of a sudden I shrink a little bit. Why can't I bring that energy in there? And then when I start, started to figure out how to bring dad energy into my business meetings, uh, now we're on video. It's like, why can't I bring my personality and my, my drive and like connect through, vi through video? And it's because I'm not practiced looking into a lens isn't the same as looking to another person. I was talking uh, to uh, another mentor of mine, uh, his name is Brett Culp. He is a keynote speaker, filmmaker, really incredible guy. Uh, and he had a little class when COVID hit, he decided to do a little class on how to get better on video. And the, after we did a bunch of, I did a bunch of lives uh, on Facebook and I was exhausted after every time. Like I just wanted to lay down and die after every 15 minute live. Hmm. Couldn't figure it out and he said, it's because being on camera, being on video, you need to emote so much more. You need to take so much more energy to put it into the camera that it's draining. Also, when you have a live audience, uh, the audio, you know, you're, you're the lightning, the audience is the thunder. So you strike your lightning, the, the audience gives you back energy. When you're on camera, you're the lightning and the thunder. I went, oh, so much energy much more sense of why when I'm done with doing something on camera, uh, it, 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 it's drained, drained the life out of me. And now through repetition and practice and, and, and doing things that are way outside my comfort zone, telling a story on camera to actual people instead of to a lens is something that you, know, you and I and the rest of the people in the mastermind can now do. What a great way of, of framing it and not to use the camera or video pun, but it's, but it's true. And, you know, you mentioned Tony Robbins as an example, as a, as a part of a description for yourself at the beginning of our conversation. And I look at Tony Robbins, I've seen him live before, and then you see him doing some of these virtual events today, you know, where he has how many hundreds of thousands of people on screen around him and imagine the energy level that he puts out in a live event versus what he's doing virtual to be able to convey that same incredible level of energy that you would experience live or as close to that as possible. It's, it, it's mind numbing. It, it truly is. And, and you and I feel you know, just a, a small degree 
of of that feeling you know after we do something like this or after we do a video imagine doing that oh, don't, for don't you dare minimize our conversation here <laughs> i won't minimize it tony robbins and his hundred thousand people don't you dare we are just as important as tony robbins even though we don't have the ice bath to jump into before we get on camera true true <laughs> absolutely not not to minimize it at all so i i would love to hear from you what words you use to describe yourself today versus how you would have described yourself back in your darker times? Huh. That's really interesting. That, like, that's a question I'd never been asked. Uh, how would I describe myself? I try not to. The difference between Mark then and Mark now is uh, Mark... Hmm. I don't, <laughs> I don't buy Mark anymore. So like, I am really not that interested in Mark anymore. I'm more interested in living and more interested in, in experiencing than Mark himself. Uh, so describing Mark uh, is counterintuitive to me now uh, because Mark is brilliant and witty and a little charming and a little charismatic. And Mark is self-conscious and scared and, and um, you know, and gets in his own way. And, and, you know, Mark helps a lot of people and changes people's lives, right? And then Mark eats too much. Uh, you know, so, so how do I describe, Mark is just like a whole collection of humanity, which I spend my time trying to live through, rise above uh, and, and create things because again, that Mark who, that Mark who uh, was homeless and couldn't put two sticks together um, still exists. Uh, I just have to less, I just give him less and less energy and more and more energy to whatever wants to be created, whatever wants to come through me. It's how I did my father, uh, my parenting. It's how I live my relationship. It's how I do, it's actually how I do anything. Uh, because that the shadow of, of that other Mark is always with me. I always see him. Mm. Beautifully said. I wish I could say I, I was healed, uh, but Mark was, has never been healed. Uh, I've just learned to less and less give him uh, and all of that uh, airtime. Excellent. No, I love, I love the way that you stated that. So with, with that said, it, what is something that you believed about yourself that you found out later in life wasn't true? Oh, that one I can answer. Uh, um, that I'm a that I'm a powerful leader. Uh, that I that I have consequence in the world. That I make an impact on people. Uh, um, that what I do say uh, uh, matters in the world. I would say that up until. Uh, a few years ago, I wasn't so sure that was the case. And now I'm surprised over and over and over again that my existence makes an impact on the world and a much bigger one than I ever thought. So let, let's take that for just a moment and let's hold on that, that comment. So what was the turning point? What was the switch? What was it that occurred that showed you or proved to you that you are worthy, that you are a strong leader, that you're plenty capable in all the other ways that you just described how you show up? I think the first was with my kids, hmm. just seeing what an impact, you know, and, and really owning the fact that I am their dad, I am their father. We all talk about father issues and all the impact of our dads in the world and all that stuff. And then I think, oh, I'm a dad to these young men. And as they've grown up into young men who shave and have jobs and all that stuff, uh, how important I still am to them. Uh, you know, it hasn't changed from five years old to 24 years old, it, it, you know, I loom large in their life. And I, it's undeniable, I can't, when I was suicidal, I realized the thing that kept me from killing myself was that I had children and I couldn't leave them that legacy, that I impact their life. And if I end mine, I'm going to give that to them. So that was really a big deal. But the real turning point was I was part of, a, um, 
another kind of mastermind workshoppy kind of thing it was a little crazy, but one of the one of the processes uh, was a competition of how much impact you had on the group. So there was like 75 people and they voted on how much impact you made on the entire group. And the, the top eight people who got the most votes got to go into a special, special place uh, to show how much they impacted people. Uh, now the, the kicker was you also had to vote for yourself. So you could give your vote away to someone else who needed it or you, had, or you, or you um, uh, uh, voted for yourself. I didn't know that I got enough votes to be in the top eight of that whole entire group. I got enough votes to be on that, on that, on that stage, but I didn't vote for myself. I gave my vote to someone else who I felt needed it more than I did. He happened to remind me of my son. And when I look, when I stood in front of him, I said, oh no, he's gonna have my vote. Uh, what, I, what I saw was there was eight chairs and there were seven people. Nobody had gotten enough votes to be on that platform that talked about your impact in the world. And what I learned from that was, if I don't do my job, there's nobody else to do my job. That seat stays empty. I'm not taking somebody else's seat because I gave, I gave him that vote so he could have the seat. Nobody got that seat. And for me, I could go, I'm close to tears. That showed me that Mark J. Silverman, whoever, whatever he is, belongs here and needs to do his job because there's nobody else to do his job. So that, that was a very powerful uh, moment for me when I, I was just staring at that empty chair saying, that's my chair and I'm not in it. Wow. The most powerful stories that you tell come right here from the heart. That one definitely gives me chills. The description, I can imagine that chair sitting there empty and I can, I, I can only begin to imagine that, that feeling that you must have had at that point. But what a pinnacle moment, right? What an opportunity. And look at what you've been able to take from that and where you are today. So it's, it's in those moments that make the biggest difference in our lives. If we're willing to capitalize on them, if we're willing to pay attention to them, keep our eyes wide open and take the lessons from those yeah, hopefully, hopefully those Hopefully those experiences are louder than the voices inside that are going to try and negate them as soon as the experience is over. You know, the head is going to go right in and say, yeah, it was just a stupid little thing. It was a play. It was nothing, right? It didn't mean all that you think it meant and all that stuff. So this is just going to, this is going to fill that in as soon as it possibly can. But hopefully the experience is solid enough and big enough that, you know, you can, you can like separate in your mind and stay with it. Yes. So I want to, since you brought that up, this wasn't necessarily the, the direction that I had, had planned on, which is completely fine, uh, because I wanted to keep this a very organic conversation. But I also think it's, it's a good lesson to learn and an important lesson to learn on how we do our best to manage those voices in our heads, that negative self-talk. And, and the reason that I'm even touching on this is I recently interviewed a world-renowned psychologist who wrote a national best-selling book that speaks to this in detail and provides the not only the science behind that self-talk, but also the tools and strategies that we can use to push past that. And I'd, I'd be very curious to find out how you are able to either manage, work with, or use that self-talk as fuel. Yeah, I'm I'm a um, little bit of a heretic on that. I don't I don't manage my self-talk. I don't manage my thoughts. I don't manage any of it. It's freaking insane up there. Mm -hmm. uh, and I finally figured out it's just insane up there. And there's nothing I'm going to do about it. In fact, most of the thoughts that probably hit my head are probably not even mine. They're just kind of thoughts that are going by and I happen to catch them. 
Uh, but you know, a lot of the thoughts that I have are just repetitive. They're the same thoughts I had yesterday and the day before and the day before and the day before, and the same thoughts I had in high school about myself. And uh, did you ever see um, A Beautiful Mind with Russell Crowe? I did. So in the movie, Russell Crowe uh, has these people in his life that are with him. And he finds out later in his life that he's been imagining these people. One of them is a little girl and he notices over the years, she never got older. So he realizes that he's hallucinating people in his life. Once he, real, once he learned that he was hallucinating people in his life, when he saw those people, they never went away. They followed him everywhere he goes and he would tip his hat to them and, and all that. But he realized he, they weren't real. And if someone knocked on the door, he would open the door and he would have to ask him, are you real? <laughs> right? That's how I am with my thoughts, right? They're always going to be with me. They're going to say the same thing. They're going to try different tactics. And the less energy I can give them, the, you know, I, I talk to my clients about this all the time. They, you know, like, I just want to get rid of the thoughts. They just want to, I'm like, I can't help you with that. I don't know that Eckhart Tolle and Byron Katie don't have thoughts. I do know that they don't pay attention to them, right? Like, so the, the Dalai Lama has talked about how his mind attacks him. Right? He just doesn't pay attention to it. So if they have thoughts, I'm going to have thoughts. So I just do my, my best to take the energy away from them and just go forward. Yeah, interesting. Well, there's uh, part of my morning routine includes a meditation practice. And it, that meditation practice can vary in length. But what that has done for me is it's allowed me to at least recognize the thoughts versus just allowing the thoughts to come and control my, my emotions, how I'm going to show up that day, uh, paint a, a, a story that's not true, or that's going to take me down a negative path. So that practice, it, it, at least it gives me the tool to pay attention. And from there, I have a choice at least oh. I have a choice what to do so I can let that thought go or in which is what was happening before I started that meditative practice is I would grasp onto that thought and then it would just take me down a negative spiral. So you're, you're, it takes practice, right? It, you, there's neural pathways going on in there and there's super highways of certain negative, horrible thoughts. And if you want to carve a new neural highway, you meditate, you journal, you do self-inquisition, you, 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 you contemplate and you start to make new neural pathways. So you do work with that. The problem for me is the other ones just never went away. So as soon as the roadblock comes off, we go and right down that bumpy road again, right? So I, I, I realize that it's a practice every day. So I'm I do meditate every morning. I do journal every morning. I do self-inquiry all the time on everything. I'm constantly going, is that real? Is what I'm thinking about that real? Like, like I'm Russell Crowe all day long. Should I believe that thought? Should I believe my opinion on that? Uh, you know, you watch the news. Are they right? Are they wrong? So self-inquiry is, is the way to deal with that. Absolutely. So we have, we have a number of entrepreneurs and small business owners that are regular viewers and listeners to this podcast. And one of the things that is always of interest is to find out what types of, of routines do you use to empower yourself, to be able to show up as your best self, to be the most engaged and just be incredibly you and connected. And you just mentioned some of those. So to kind of walk us through, if you will, what that either morning or evening routines, what they look like. And are you regimented about this? Do you do this every single day? Do you forgive yourself if you miss a day? How does kind of walk us through that, if you will? So I used to be maniacally regimented because it was such a mess. I really had to be, you know, I counted the number of days I, I meditated in a row. Like I was maniacal about my food. I was maniacal about my exercise uh, because getting off the path was just so messy and getting back on was so hard. Uh, I'm a lot more relaxed about it now, but I still, 
uh, get up at uh, 530 in the morning, right? Have my coffee. Uh, and this is blasphemy. I have my coffee before I meditate. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, you know, I get on my cushion, I read, I meditate, and I exercise. Uh, so those are, those are the, those are the non-negotiables. Uh, the journaling uh, is probably four or five days a week. Uh, and, you know, sometimes I'll do more meditation than journaling. So, you know, like, so I'll, 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 I'll mix it up. Uh, the food thing is, is always been vexing to me. I'm, I've always had trouble with food. So for me, if I don't eat sugar and I don't eat wheat, I'm a completely different human being than when I do when I drink when I eat sugar and when I eat wheat. Uh, the inflammation and the you know um, the negative effects are are bigger. Uh, the rest of the diet is you know again trial and error and a little bit of uh, vanity and trying to stay thin at my advanced age. <laughs> um, and then I and then the huge piece is I stay around people who think more highly of me than I do. Mm. Uh, so everybody in my life thinks really highly of me. Uh, and, uh, you know, so much so to the point where I'm embarrassed by how highly they think of me. And then I spend my time making them right. Uh, so that, that's, that's, that's the, those, those are the boats that help my boat rise is all the people around me. Like you said, such nice, such nice things about me, such kind things. Uh, that's what I surround myself with because that's what I need to hear. I do enough in here to, to screw with myself. Right. So I need, I need the people around me to combat that. Isn't that interesting that you work to live up to what other people feel or say about you? And My this first, is the, the way first person, the first person who took me off the streets, uh, when I, when I was really a mess, she said, she said, you can be right, or you can make me right. She says, if you make me right, your life will be better. And, you know, cause she told me I was competent. I could do, you know, like all these things. And I was like, okay, I'll make you right. You know, and she says, and every time I screwed up or was just kind of went down into a spiral, she'd be like, who's being right? That was really helpful. So I make the people, I, and I, by the way, I make sure I have people I trust in my life. Sure, uh, yeah. So they're blowing smoke up my ass. I am always checking to see who's blowing smoke up my ass so that I can't trust them, right? So, um, <laughs> so I have people who are unassailable in my life like you. You know, I, I love that. And, but, but it reminds me how often we're not self-aware enough about our own strengths and about our own capabilities. And so much of that is tied back to the stories we tell ourselves. But when you have a trusted group of advisors around you who recognize those strengths and can reinforce those strengths and give you examples of where you're incredibly strong and where you're gifted or where you allow your, your talents and your, your strengths to shine bright. It's, it's, you know, that's, that goes a long way. That it goes a long totally way. It, it, yeah. It's um, and, and we don't hear enough of the good stuff, right? It's, we're only as good as the last job we did. You know, I'm sure you've heard that before, and it's it's too easy to pick up on the things that didn't go well, or focus on the failures, or you know, focus on the adversities that we experienced versus all of the great things that you've done. And when we start to have greater perspective, when we can start to celebrate the wins, when we can start to celebrate ourselves and our own greatness and the the wonderful things that we're capable of doing, it without attaching ego to it, right? But when we're actually looking at the facts, it starts to paint a very different picture. Mm. So I want to talk about your latest book, Only Tens 2.0. And this is the book, and we're going to link to this in the show notes. This is a very interesting book. So I, read it. I did read it. Yes. And there's some excellent information in there. There's some great insights. What I would love for you to do for all of those that are listening or watching is share with us how this book first came to be, what the process was like writing it, and then share with us what only tens means. And let's take some 
let's take some practical information that we can share. Obviously, we, we're not going to go through the entire book. We want people to purchase this book so they can truly experience it and then apply it. But let's give them a taste of what they can look forward to and how it can help and benefit them. Okay. So I wrote the book for myself. Uh, I am severely ADD, or at least Mark is severely ADD, and uh, uh, really paying attention for any period of time whatsoever is really tough. Uh, in fact, I had a psychiatrist put electrodes on my head that said I had no executive function whatsoever. Uh, there was nothing between me and an impulse. <laughs> uh, and he showed it me, he showed it to me, and I, he gave me a medication that gave me that pause. And I was like, wow, that's really cool. So I was taking Ritalin, uh, and I learned this, you know, we did, had my son tested for ADD, and we all took the test so we could make him feel better. And it turned out that dad was off the charts, and the psychiatrist wondered how I even functioned. Uh, and I was, I, was, I was a coach by then, and I was doing things that I loved, and I still couldn't figure out how to get things done. Uh, and then I, was, I narrowed things down so that I only had a couple of things on my list, and I still felt like I couldn't get them done. Uh, and then the realization came that actually, I always get done what I want to get done. If I want to do something, nothing stops me. If there's a new iPhone, I have it before it hits the shelf, right? It doesn't matter how much, biz like, oh my God, I'm so busy, I don't have time. I find time to get the iPhone, right? Well, when, I, when I decided I wanted to run the Marine Corps Marathon and I couldn't run a mile, I ran the Marine Corps Marathon. I trained for the Marine Corps Marathon. I, I did everything I needed to do. I hired a coach, right? Everything. Uh, so the, the, the lie that I don't, can't get things done was really shown to me. Uh, so when I started to look at, oh, the things that I'm having trouble getting done, I don't really wanna do in the first place. Right? Things I committed to that I said yes to that I don't really feel like doing. Oh my God, I I'm so sorry I didn't get back to you on that. No, I'm not. I didn't want to do it, but I couldn't have the conversation to say I didn't want to do it. So now a pattern started to show up of if I really want to do something, I do it. If I don't want to do something at whatever age I am, I'm still a stubborn child. I won't do it or I'll do it on the deadline. Like, I, like as a sales guy, that whole hockey stick thing, like... Yeah. I came in at the end of the quarter, every quarter. Like I always blew my number out the door, but it was always at the last minute at the end of the corner, quarter and it was horrible because as a procrastinator, if you, are, if you guys wanna look up Tim Urban uh, procrastination on his TED talk, it is hysterical mm -hmm. uh, because he talks about how the only thing that gets us, us procrastinators and us ADD people on the stick is a deadline, right? So the reason I got things done or the reason I made my number was because I didn't want to look like a fool. I didn't care about making sales. I didn't want to look like a fool. So at the end of the quarter, I got all my sales in. So I didn't look good. So I started to realize that everything had a qualifier. There was something behind everything that I wanted to do. I either wanted a reward or I wanted to avoid a consequence. I'm more of a stick person. So I more get things done to avoid a consequence than get the reward. The iPhone, total reward. Um, you know, any kind of electronics, total reward. Uh, but, but so I started to look at that. And then I started to look at the things on my to do list. And I started to see, oh, this is on my to do list, because I didn't tell them I don't want to do that. And then I started seeing that things were on my to do list that I wanted to do. But it wasn't urgent. I didn't really, really have juice for it. It didn't have to get done. So that's where the 10 came in. So a 10 is it has to be done, has to be done by me and it has to be done by me today. Or I really have juice to do it. And what I know is there's only one, two or three tens every day. Uh, one of my clients uh, just went into the hospital last week, had emergency surgery, cleared his schedule. We had our coaching call yesterday and he said, you know, it's amazing how much I didn't have to do. <laughs> I'm so busy and how much I didn't have to do. And I said, excuse me, did you read the freaking book? He's like, yes, I read your book. I understand, I get it. There's only a few tens, right? But it took him going into the hospital. So when he was in the hospital, if he had to approve something or want, like there were only a few things that had to be done uh, and the rest could be delegated and could, you know, or could wait. Um, so I started to realize that I didn't have a time management problem. I had an honesty problem. 
I wasn't honest with people. So someone would come up with a really cool project. And I love this person. They're the most amazing person. Jay Shear comes to me and says, Mark, you want to do this business thing? It's so cool. Oh my God. Uh, and I want to work with Jay Shear because I, like, I think he's amazing. But the project's a good project, but I don't have a ton of juice. I have a ton of juice for Jay, but I don't have a ton of juice for the project. Oh, now I can have this conversation. And it's a sweaty palm, scary conversation. Jay, you are a 10 for me. God, I love you. And I really want to find something to work with you on. But this project ain't it. It's an eight for me. And if it's an eight, what I know about myself is you're going to hate me in a couple of months because I'm not going to get my shit done. So I started to look at, oh, these are all difficult conversations. Everything between us and the freedom that we want is a difficult conversation and a choice. Uh, we're, you know, the, the, the phrase uh, busyness equals laziness uh, because it's so much easier to be overwhelmed than to actually sit and decide what you need to spend your time on. Mm. Uh, you know, that badge of honor of at the end of the day, I gotta have a beer and watch the Netflix because I work so hard today. Bullshit. Like, it's just bullshit. I, I, I work with people who work so hard and we spend so much time at each other's desks talking, you know, and, and, and shooting the shit and doing stuff, you know, that was completely superfluous to what we had to do for the day. So focusing on that. So that's how the book came across. Uh, I, wrote, I wrote the book for myself and it had all kinds of grammatical errors and spelling errors. It was horrible because I didn't realize I needed a copy editor. Nobody told me this shit. Uh, I wrote the book in 90 days. Because uh, mm -hmm. again, the guy with ADD, after 90 days, I'm not going to be interested in the book anymore. <laughs> in fact, after I published it, I was like, I don't want anything to do with this book anymore. But it sold 60,000 copies. We're coming up on 70,000 copies now with the second edition. Mm. Uh, and I've getting le cards and letters and people are saying, you know, again, remember to talk about earlier in the call about our impact. Yes. Uh, just got a text from somebody on, on Facebook. I said, oh my God, only tens is a game changer. You just changed my life with this. And I'm like, this was a silly little thing that I did for myself to figure out how to get some things done. And it seems like uh, the rest of the world really in, you know, is getting something out of it. You and I have talked about this offline. I'm in a, a very different phase right now in my life. I spent so many years like that person that you described, the always being busy, saying yes to everything, being spread thin, and, and not having the wherewithal to truly identify what the level 10 items are. So I could attack those with the with the vigor and energy that I do have. And I've learned over time, and it's still a work in progress for me, but it's really about identifying the tens, what's truly essential, what's going to move the needle, where can I pour 110% of myself into that's going to see the type of returns that align with my goals, my vision, my dreams, and go after those and use the power of saying no, just like you described, you'd love to work with Jay, but the project that I'm attached to, it doesn't hit. So we have to have those difficult conversations to be able to say no, but let's take a look at a different opportunity that we can work together on down the road. But this one, thank you, but no thank you. Every time I have that conversation, the other person goes, you know, this wasn't really a 10 for me either. <laughs> and it's like, oh, good. Let's go find something that is a 10. Uh, there you, know, you go. The, the one thing I want people to get out of the book, uh, if, I, if I have a desire, is once I, once I reread my own book, uh, you, you can no longer be a victim of circumstance after you read the book. Uh, the, you, know, you now realize that you're always choosing. I am always choosing with my time, with my attention, with all, I'm always choosing. I am not a victim of anybody else. I'm not a victim of my calendar. I'm not a victim of my schedule. I have chosen to put everything on that calendar. Uh, and it's it's so empowering. It's, it's a little demoralizing at first, but then it's empowering. Absolutely. And just keep in mind that if you don't make the decision, someone else is going to make the decision for you, whether you know it or not. But ultimately, it comes down to you and you being in control of how you're going to invest your time and deciding on 
the projects that you want to work on and identifying what's most important. So I, I want to switch gears and talk about your podcast, Mastering Midlife. You are a prolific podcast host. You go deep. You, you're thoughtful in the questions that you ask. You take the time to learn about your guests. You bring on amazing guests. And thank you for having me on your show. It was a great conversation and I appreciate that. But share with us where the concept and idea behind Mastering Midlife came from and why is that important to you to use your voice and that platform to share what Mastering Midlife is about? So first we know that the podcast is a 10 because there's 290 episodes. Ooh. Nothing gets in the way of me getting a podcast recorded and on the air. So I know it's a 10. I know it's, it's part of my juice and it's something I will do. How do I know? Because I look back and I've done it and I, I rarely miss. Let's talk about you being on the show. So Mastering Midlife, how to thrive when the world asks the most of you. Uh, for me, uh, it's, it's about tips. And, there's, there's plenty of podcasts and conversations and you have conversations all the time with people on how to run your business, the nuts and bolts, the plumbing, the profit and loss, you know, revenue streams, all that stuff. And you, you know, you, you are a master at how to help people run profitable businesses. I'm not. So I ask you to be on my show, uh, but I ask you to be on my show because of a different conversation that we had. I don't need to have Jay come on to my the Mastery Midlife podcast and talk to people about how to run the nuts and bolts of their business to get the maximum amount of profit. What I want, what I was interested in with you is, you know, you're, you're a guy in your 50s uh, like me. And uh, you're vibrant and you're interested and you're curious and you're energetic and, you're, and, and you, know, you just serve those around you and you show up in such a way that um, it's, it's breathtaking. What I wanted to know from you is if I'm in my 50s and I wanna show up like that because I still got game, because I'm tired, I'm gonna be 59 years old, I'm tired sometimes, right? We talked about that. We have to conserve our energy. We have to choose where we're gonna put our energy. So you started, so I got you on the podcast and you talked about your morning routine and you talked about how maniacally you are about exercise and food and the people that you surround yourself with, just like we talked about earlier. Because if you want in your 50s to be healthy, to be curious, to be in, you know, interested, to be in relationship, to, to, to still be in that creative flow, it takes a lot more energy than it does if you're 35 years old. Right? We've been through we've been through a lot. We have kids, you know. So, uh, what is the term I just learned today from one of my clients? The triple squeeze. Uh, you got kids who need to go to college. You got elderly parents to take care of, and you got to save for your own retirement. Huh. And you're getting kind of tired, right? And you're still <laughs> trying to you're still trying to stay fit. You're still trying to compete, and you're trying to have sex with your spouse, and you're trying like like you're trying to do all this stuff while the whole world is crushing in on you. So that's the whole point of the podcast is how can we be amazing when the world is crushing in on us? Because when people describe my, my podcast and what I do, they talk about, you know, this is Mark is the midlife crisis guy. No, I'm the guy who's looking at the opportunity in life when, when life is, is whispering to you, something needs to change. You need to do things a little bit differently. You need to be like Michael Jordan and change your game as the game evolves, as your body changes. You need to, you need to shift and change and grow in order to keep in the game and keep in the game at a level that's, that's viable. So that's, that's why I have the podcast. So I just learn from people. I learn, I learn about sex in your 50s. I learn about mental health. I learn about strategies for time and energy management. I learn about, we talk about leadership and running companies and things like that. All of that is more mature wisdom. So that's what I hope people come to my podcast for you. And they'll come to your podcast to learn how to freaking make lots of money. There you go. You have got to check out this podcast. Now, Mark, you, you light up when you talk about things that are important to you. And this has been a wonderful conversation. Yeah, we haven't even when talked I, about my new fish tank. <laughs> we have, right. We haven't talked about your fish tank. So if you want to learn about Mark's fish tank and see some incredible videos and some beautiful fish, connect with Mark on Facebook, which we're going to be providing the link to that as well. 
But again, I, I just, I want to go back. The podcast is a special one and you, you do such a wonderful job of exploring the topic of mastering midlife with amazing people. And it's a great podcast to listen to and to learn from. So everyone definitely go check that out. So Mark, before we end our conversation here today, I, I wanted to ask you what message, what overarching message you'd like to leave our audience with? Uh, the message I always want to leave people with, you're actually free. You don't know it yet, but you're actually free. People uh, put themselves in prisons. Uh, they think that they, the key has been thrown away. They don't even need a key because there's not even a door. You are free if you just take the time to look around. Wow. That's a powerful one. And where can we go to connect with you, consume your content? Uh, MarkJSilverman.com. Mark, the letter J, Silverman.com. Uh, my, my book's there, my podcast's there. Uh, I have all kinds of free uh, uh, workshops and stuff on, on the website. You can do the only 10s online workshop and not even read the book. You can just watch the videos and do the exercises and you don't even have to give me my $2.50. Uh, so you know, just go there and you get everything you need. Outstanding. And here's a final question for you. What are you adding or eliminating from your life to live more fulfilled and with greater purpose? Portion sizes. <laughs> Honest to God, uh, portion sizes. I, uh, I've got, you know, the sugar's gone, the wheat's gone. I'm doing really, you know, that's easy. That's the easy part but I eat, still eat too much. So uh, the past few weeks, I've been actually looking at my portion size. Uh, so, cause even a lot of really healthy food <laughs> keep you, keep you, keep you overweight. And I have a ton of really nice clothes that I don't fit into. So I don't need to buy any new clothes. So that's what I'm letting go of portion sizes. Fantastic. I have never received that response before. So <laughs> thank you. <laughs> that's a great one. So Mark, I, I just want you to know how grateful I am for you. I'm so appreciative of having this conversation today, you being candid and transparent and sharing of your knowledge and your experience and bringing only tens to life and being your remarkable self and, and showing up the way that you do. You're a, a powerful individual. You're an inspiring individual. You've got a wonderful voice and a wonderful message and thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Jay. Absolutely. And for all of you, thank you so very much for watching and listening. Please take a moment to subscribe, rate, and review. And let us know what you thought of this episode. Pop a comment in. Let us know maybe two or three takeaways that were most meaningful for you. We would love to hear that. And then... To enjoy more episodes and to learn how J. Shear Business Consulting can help you build a stronger foundation for your business and see better results, just visit jshearbusinessconsulting.com. And until next time, keep learning and growing. Make sure you pick up a copy of Only Tens 2.0, and we'll see you on the next Business Minds Coffee Chat. Take care. Jay. Jay Shear. Jay Shear. Jay Shear. Jay Shear. Business Consultant. Jay Shear. Jay Shear Business Consulting. <laughs>